welcome. Welcome to the University Baptist Church. We are glad that you're here, and I want to welcome those who are live streaming as well. And let me say again, as I say last week, we really, really miss you, and uh, we hope to see you again soon, but no pressure, of course, from us. Just a couple of announcements. We do plan to meet on Wednesday night again with our men's groups, our women's groups. We got off to a good start last week, and uh, the women, again, will be in the fellowship hall, and the men will be here in the auditorium, and we'll also be Zooming both of those meetings. And so if you can't make it out, you're welcome to join by Zoom. And I'm really hoping that this uh, technology that we've been using will become permanent for those who can't make it out to different services, that we'll have this available for you in a different format. So again, even if you can't come on Wednesday night, feel free to log in by Zoom. Mary Margaret will send out the email link to that uh, for you. And then next week is the first Sunday in June, and we do plan to take communion. We have not taken communion together as a church family since March, and we're very, very excited about this. Things will be a little bit different. We're not going to pass the communion plates as normal. We have these little uh, communion packets that have both the wafer and the juice together in one little packet. Uh, somebody very creative put these things together, and you can order these. And uh, thanks to Mary Waters, I think, for discovering these for us. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, have a table set up in the lobby, and those little communion packets will be there on the table. We'll have those set out on Thursday of this week, and so whoever's setting those out, if they have germs in their hands, those germs will be long gone by Sunday, or maybe wins, I don't know. We're, we're doing what we can, all right? And, uh, so as you come in next week, as you come in, would you just pick up your communion supplies, and uh, that'll keep us from having to pass that out. It'll be sealed, so it won't spill. All right, and uh, we're going we're gonna to try as best we can to uh, have a communion service next Sunday. So again, as you come into the building next Sunday, pick up your communion supplies. And in addition to that, since we are live streaming into the Fellowship Hall over here, all right, we would like to reserve that space for anybody who really wants to come but feels vulnerable, feels like they can't come either because of their age or their pre-existing conditions, but really feels like they should be here for a communion service. Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm primarily speaking to those who are on live stream right now, but if you would like to come next Sunday and be part of that communion service, we will reserve the fellowship hall for you. We'll ask that parents with children not go to the fellowship hall. If you'd like to use one of the other rooms in there for your children, that's fine. If you want to, am I right, Lee, the teen room, we can, we can broadcast in the teen room over here. Okay, Lee's tell me that's true. So, uh, if you can't use the nursery but don't want to come in here with your little kids, let me ask that next week you go to the teen room or that you go into one of the other buildings, one of the rooms in the Fellowship Hall, the International Classroom or Dr. Dunn's classroom there, and they'll reserve the large portion of the Fellowship Hall for anybody who is vulnerable to coronavirus but really feels like they should come and want to participate in communion. And we'll have some of those little communion packets already set out on the tables in there. All right, so again, to those of you out there on live stream, if you would like to do that, you're welcome to come. But don't, please don't feel any pressure from us. We're not asking that you come back if you feel vulnerable. And if you are more vulnerable uh, because of your age or pre-existing conditions, all right, but we will make that available to you next week. And children, let me just say to you, you all have been through a lot. I know the uh, children's church isn't available to you, so next week's sermon actually is going to be oriented toward the children. All right, we're going to stop Romans. Today we're in Romans 11, which is really hard for kids. And so next week, children, I'm going to preach a sermon really directed more to the kids, and I'm going to explain what communion is all about, why we take communion. So if you want to read ahead a little bit, uh, here's a big challenge for you. Uh, read the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to be in the Gospel of Mark next week, and uh, we're going to be looking at the feeding of the 5,000 and also Jesus' institution of the communion supper. And so uh, if you would like to read ahead, kids, uh, please do so. And I will address everyone but you specifically next week. All right, and I do believe that's all of our announcements, and uh, we will be making a decision uh, this week, I think, about congregational singing and when to start doing that again, and I'm really looking forward to that, but for now, we're going to continue with what has quickly become status quo, and that is our musicians up here, and uh, very, very grateful. You know, this means a lot of work for the people up here, uh, so we're very, very grateful to them, but they're going to 
uh, warm our hearts now with some singing, and then uh, uh, we'll have the scripture reading, and then I'll come back and preach from Romans chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 7. In your Bibles, please. Proverbs chapter 7. It 
It's good to be here and to see, see each of you. Proverbs 7. We are continuing our way through Proverbs, and we are reading today of a father's exhortation to his son. And he talks to his son, exhorting him to be careful of uh, a wayward woman. Okay? Proverbs 7, the words of the Lord. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call insight your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words. For at the window of my house I have looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him. Dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart, she is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home, now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices. And today I have paid my vows, so now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon he will come home. With much seductive speech she persuades him. With her smooth talk she compels him. All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O sons, listen to me, and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways, do not stray into her paths, for many a victim has she laid low, and all her slain are a mighty throng. Her way is the her house, rather, is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. Let's pray. Lord how good it is to come together as your people. We want to thank you for your watch care over us these several weeks. Lord, not many of us, if any, have been touched directly through the COVID-19 condition. Lord, we thank you that you have been good in your care for us. Your mercies indeed are new every morning. We do pray, O oh Lord, as a people, as a country, Lord, as the world, Lord, that we would 
find mercy in your eyes. Lord, we pray that you would help those who are in distress, those who are ill, those who are fearful, those who are vulnerable, O oh Lord, the protector of the oppressed. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy. O oh Lord, today we remember racial tensions because of which there are protests and burnings and emotional uh, tirades in the media, online. Lord, we thank you that the blood of your cross has brought together Jew and Gentile. Lord, we look forward, we long for the day when gathered before you will be peoples from every tribe and tongue and nation, not against each other, but in solidarity, not fighting, not hurling insults and weapons, but rather singing, singing to you. We long for that day and we pray, O oh Lord, that we as your people would be examples of the spirit, of what your spirit can do in bringing people from diverse backgrounds together. Lord, today we pray for the preaching of your word. Lord, that it would encourage us. There are many here who are uh, discouraged, who may be fearful. Lord, who uh, need to hear. We need to hear from you. So would you come now, O Spirit of God? Would you be here? We do pray for our children. Lord, that you would give them the, the resolve to hear listen to your word. So speak now, O Lord, as we, your people, hear in Jesus' name. Amen.
home two weeks ago, I thought, you know, it really is a long time for uh, those of you sitting out there to sit uh, when we don't have the congregational singing. So does everyone just stand up for just a minute? You only want to stand and uh, stretch your legs a minute and I'll pray and then uh, we can be seated and we'll get into Romans chapter 11. I meant to do this last week and I forgot, so sorry about that. Um, every now and then I'll take a class or visit a lecture of a colleague, and you sit there for 50 minutes, and it just, I just, I can't do that. I just have to move. So, sorry about that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that as Joseph prayed, that you are in control of all things, and we look at our world, it's full of chaos, it's full of confusion, but we're thankful, Lord, that your word speaks truly, and Lord, the most important question we can ask is, not what does the Bible say about current crises, but what does the Bible say about everything. And Lord, we know that we live in a fallen, a broken world, a world full of injustice, a world full of sin, a world full of misery and pain and murder and suffering. We pray, Lord, that through all that is happening with the coronavirus, with the mob violence, with the injustice that does indeed happen, Lord, even from the highest courts of our land all the way down to public law enforcement, we pray, Lord, that people in these troubling situations would turn and see Christ as a solution and see Christ as the Savior who has come to redeem us in our humanity and to resurrect us, Lord, so that we might sing together your praises and as Joseph prayed, we do long for the day when we all sing together before your throne. And then after that day, Lord, in which you will wipe away every last tear. And I pray, Lord, that you would, even today, bring many, many people in your kingdom. The fullness of the Gentiles, and also, Lord, a harvest of the Jews, we pray. Grant us understanding, Lord, as we continue with Romans 11. And help us, Lord, to understand this uh, perhaps difficult and complex subject, and we pray it for Christ's sake. Amen. All right, well, we are in Romans chapter 11, and I do want to sort of pick up where we left off last week after minimal review. In Romans 1 through 8, Paul has explained the gospel. And in chapter 8, Paul asserted that nothing in all creation can separate God's love from God's people. But if that is true, why has God apparently rejected Israel, his own people? And the potential for that question to undermine everything that Paul has said in Romans 1 through 8 is so serious that he will take some three chapters to deal with it, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And in chapter 11, so far, Paul's argument is threefold. First, God has not rejected the Jew 
because Paul himself is a Jew. Second, Paul says, just as in Elijah's day, there is a remnant today of believing Jews. And thirdly, Paul acknowledges in an illustration of an olive tree that for the present, Jews have been cast aside while wild branches are grafted in. The natural branches cast out, the wild branches grafted in. However, Paul, a God rather, can indeed graft those natural branches right back into that stalk if he so pleases. And Paul wrote in the second half of Romans 11 and verse 23, these are the words that we considered last week, God has the power to graft them in again. And that statement left us, left us with a question that we began answering last week. And that is, will God, in fact, graft the Jews back into the olive tree? Certainly he has the power to do so. I don't think anyone would question that, but will he do so? Now the whole question of how Israel and the Gentiles relate to the gospel is quite curious. And understand, that's why Paul uses the term mystery in verse 25. A mystery was a truth that was largely veiled in the Old Testament, but unveiled in the New Testament. And last week, we also turned to several key texts which concern the covenants that God made with Israel and with Judah. And let me just review that quickly also. One of those texts was Jeremiah chapter 31. In fact, that's probably the most important text. And Paul will cite that text in verse 27 where he writes, And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And the them and the there in the original context is the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In Jeremiah 31, we learn that God will replace the Sinaitic covenant that he made back there when he redeemed those people out of Egypt in the future with a new covenant that he will make with Israel and Judah. And that covenant, again, includes four major provisions. Number one, God will change their hearts. Number two, God will have a relationship with those people. Number three, listen to this. I'm quoting directly. They shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And number four, what about their sin? God will forgive their iniquity. Those are the four provisions of the covenant in Jeremiah. And so the question is, has that ever happened? Well, Jesus preached about that change of heart. And Jesus said in Luke 22 that he would inaugurate a new covenant in his blood. And Hebrews 8 clearly states that Jesus did, in fact, inaugurate the new covenant. And the author quotes Jeremiah 31 as fulfilled. So, it is true that we do not live under the Old Covenant, right? We are not Old Covenant saints. We don't follow the Old Testament law like a Jew would have before Christ. We are New Covenant Christians, and we celebrate that every time we take communion. But that does leave us with a couple major questions. Question one, what does any of this have to do with the Gentiles? Jeremiah 31 said God would make that covenant with Israel and with Judah. If you're a Gentile, what does this have to do with you? Well, that's the mystery that Paul explains in Romans chapter 11. The Gentiles, here's a mystery, they're like wild branches that get grafted right into the trunk of that olive tree. And Jesus himself said many would come from the east and from the west and they will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Now, none of that was very clear in Jeremiah 31. In fact, it wasn't clear at all. But it's becoming clear in the New Testament. It's a mystery now made clear in Romans. 
And the second question that we passed over largely last week is the question, who is Israel? When God promised to give a new covenant to Israel and to Judah, is that promise now just fulfilled through the Gentiles? Is that what the Holy Spirit meant when he inspired Jeremiah to write? Peter does say that Old Testament prophets sometimes did not fully comprehend what they were even writing. They, 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 they worked on the inspiration of the Spirit, but they didn't even understand what they were writing at times. So who is Israel? This question has been so important in the history of interpretation going all the way back to the beginning of the New Testament church that I am going to devote the rest of the sermon to it. All right, so this would be sort of a theological sermon rather than an exegetical sermon. But I do think that we need to give some time and attention to this question. The truth is that Bible-believing Christians, scholars, pastors, laymen, we come down on different sides of this question. And that's because it is kind of a thorny question. But I want to say at the outset that this is not a question that separates liberals from conservatives. This is not a question that separates unbelieving scholars from believing scholars, all right? This is a discussion that happens within the family of God, within the church of God, among the people of God. And for that reason, we really need to approach it charitably. And I'm going to attempt to do that today. And I think that we may have different perspectives, even, even, different perspectives even right here in our church and that really, frankly, does not trouble me. I work, on a, I work in a community of seminary professors, and frankly, when you get to know these men, you realize they don't agree on every point. And uh, these are all my friends, all right? Theological maturity requires us to economize our dogmatisms and practice charity where brothers disagree. We should just be okay with this. We are finite, and we're trying to understand the wonderful revelation of God. So having said all that, let's work through three major answers to the question, who is Israel? And I am going to attempt to just deal with this even-handedly. I'm not coming at this with any kind of system in mind. I don't have any kind of commitment to a theological perspective. I just want to really see what the text says. All right, who is Israel? And I want to give us three options and I will spend the majority of our time on the first. So if we get you know, going into this and you're wondering, is this ever going to end? All right? Most of the time is going to be given to the first. And then I'll address two more. All right? The first is Israel is the church. Israel is a church, including both Jews and Gentiles now. Second, Israel refers to ethnic Jews. And thirdly, Israel refers to the nation, that is the geopolitical nation of Israel, that, that piece of real estate on the western shore of the Mediterranean. All right, those three options. So let's take the first, Israel is the church. This view says the promises made to Old Testament Israel find their ultimate fulfillment in the church at large, which includes both Jews and Gentiles. John Calvin, uh, a tremendous interpreter, and frankly, an exegetically precise commentator. If you've ever read his commentaries, you know that he's just really, really precise. I have all of his commentaries at home. John Calvin holds this view, and I have read him profitably through the years. Calvin writes, and I quote, I extend the word Israel to include all all the people of God. Commenting on verse 26, Romans eleven twenty-six. here's what Calvin writes. Many understand this of the Jewish people as though Paul had said that religion would again be restored among them as before. But I extend the word Israel to all the people of God. 
Now, there are many passages that do indeed speak of the union of Israel, of Jews and Gentiles, Israel and the church, one in Christ. And we cannot turn to them all, but I do want to turn to two of them, two very important ones. Let's turn first to Ephesians chapter 2 and try to understand why Calvin would make such a statement. Ephesians chapter 2. And it really will do us good to read a lengthy portion of this great passage. And again, try not to come at this passage with any preconceived ideas in mind. Just let Paul speak as I read. Ephesians 2 and verse 11. Paul writes, Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, physical Gentiles, ethnic Gentiles, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that's the Jew, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, that is the Gentiles who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And notice these precious words. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. That's Jews and Gentiles, they are one. And has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. And that's a reference to the Old Covenant. All those laws, he abolished that. That he might, here's the reason, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body, the body of Christ, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then, here's the result. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That sounds like being grafted into those covenants, right? We're built on that same foundation. Christ Jesus himself being the, the, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I would say that's really clear. God has brought Jews and Gentiles together as one new man. And one body, and one household, and a single temple for the Spirit. Paul uses the word one four times. In addition, he uses a variety of metaphors, but they are all singular. Man, body, spirit, household, temple, dwelling place. There are not two bodies two spirits, two temples. These metaphors are singular because they reflect the unity of Jews and Gentiles together in Christ. I don't see how Paul could have been any clearer. Jews and Gentiles, we are one in Christ. Gentiles, you were strangers and aliens, and now you are fellow citizens. Now, would you turn back probably one page in your Bible 
And let's look at one more passage. Galatians 6 and verse 16. And would you observe how Paul concludes Galatians? Galatians 6 and verse 16. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Paul is writing to churches in Galatia. Whether Jews or Gentiles, he refers to them collectively as the Israel of God. And how do I know that? Well, back up two verses and look at verse 14. Paul writes, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision. Here's what matters, a new creation. Clearly, Paul is referring to the gospel. His boast is the cross. And what happens when people embrace the cross? Well, verse 15 Jewish circumcision, Gentile uncircumcision, all of that becomes irrelevant. What matters is the new creation. That's the gospel. Now in verse 16, note the words, walk by this rule. What is this rule? In the immediate context, it refers to those who embrace the unity of circumcision and uncircumcision. We're embracing this rule, this rule of unity between circumcision and uncircumcision. And Paul calls for a blessing of peace and mercy upon all such people. And that's us, whether we are Jews or Gentiles. That's the church, that's believers. And it's in that same context that he says the blessing is upon now the Israel of God. Well, who can that be but Jews and Gentiles in the church who walk by this rule where there's no longer circumcision and uncircumcision. We're all one. We're all part of the Israel of God. We're all part of this new creation now. So, in my estimation, there is an Israel of God that is identical to the people of God. I mean, that's Paul's term. I was inspired by the Spirit. I didn't write that. Now again, here's what Calvin wrote. I extend the word Israel to include all the people of God. So is Calvin correct? And let me put it to you this way. If, if Calvin is in the major leagues as an interpreter, I'm not even in the minor leagues. I'm down there in the t-ball leagues, okay? You understand that. And I do believe that Calvin is largely correct. However, I have an issue with him as his thinking is applied to Romans chapter 11. All right? And I, 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 I you know, I don't say this glibly, all right? But I do have an issue with that kind of thinking being applied to Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to show you why momentarily. But before I identify the issue, I want to point out why we think, I think we need to appreciate Calvin's emphasis, right? And why we should actually listen to voices who may actually come at theology a little bit differently than you do, all right? And I'm not here to criticize everyone and any, you know, everybody, but I do want to warn us against some possible misguided thinking that uh, maybe is in our church, I don't know. In my opinion, this is my opinion again, much of what is now called classical dispensationalism, the dispensationalism of the Schofield Reference Bible, the dispensationalism that was popularized in the Bible conference movement, the prophetic conference movements, 
In fact, the dispensationalism that many, many of us grew up with, all right, classical dispensationalism, that's not my term, by the way, drew an unwarranted and rigid distinction between Israel and the church. Maybe there are some differences. I'm okay with that, all right? But the dispensationalists just opened up this wide chasm between Israel and the church, between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church, They open that thing so wide that you can't ever get the two back together again. It's like trying to leap across the Grand Canyon. Let's just get them totally separated. And frankly, if you press any theological system too far, you will wind up in heresy. Some divided between Israel and the church so rigidly that they actually effectively taught two Gospels. They taught that Old Testament Israel was saved by keeping the law and offering all those animal sacrifices, saved by works. And New Testament believers are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Two different Gospels. That's not what Paul says in Romans 4. Some interpreters taught that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount has nothing to do with us today. Did you realize that? In fact, last week after the service... One of our members, Steve Pettit, came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, back when I was in seminary, this is what we were taught. Sermon on the Mount doesn't even apply to us. That that was the thinking, right? This is all for later on. The Sermon on the Mount was for Jews during the millennium. and So we can just kind of skip over it. And that was still being taught in a few places even when I came to seminary. Some taught that Jeremiah 31... And the new covenant has nothing to do with us today. Classical dispensationalists actually define the church age as a giant parenthesis. You ever heard this? A giant parenthesis in God's scheme of salvation. I remember hearing this as a child thinking, it's kind of weird. Is that sort of like an afterthought? Like it, did God not intend for the church? Or what, what is a parenthesis? Um, The Gentile church, according to this view, is a sort of mysterious disruption in God's plan for Israel. This in spite of the fact that the Abrahamic covenant was made for all peoples. Some taught that God actually has two separate kingdoms. If you look at the old Schofield Reference Bible, there was a distinction made between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Two different kingdoms. And that Jesus offered to the Jews a geopolitical kingdom... They rejected it, and so that kingdom was postponed to the millennium, the postponement of the kingdom. You don't hear that very often, but you do hear it from time to time. And all this really amounted to two distinct plans of salvation. Once the church is raptured, God can resume his work with the Jews by reinstating Old Testament laws, by requiring Old Testament sacrifices at the temple again. And some even taught that in the eternal state, there are two separate people of God. And I actually remember reading this when I was in high school. The bride, they claim, is the church, the special people of God. And Israel consists of Old Testament believers together with tribulation and millennial saints. These are different groups of people. The, the bride, the church, and then Old Testament plus the tribulation millennial saints. Uh, they are a kind, that is the, the, the Old Testament believers and the tribulation millennial saints, these are a kind of, like, how, how can you say this, so redeemed second class citizens. Uh, they are redeemed, they're, they're going to they're gonna go to the new world, maybe they won't go into New Jerusalem, they'll be sort of out there in the outskirts. Uh, they're not part of the bride, but you know, they're going to be okay, they're, they're going to be saved. All right. I remember this sort of thinking. It was all a little bit murky. And some even claimed that only the Baptist represent the true bride of Christ. You've probably heard of this, Baptist briders, as they're called. I, I, listen, I graduated from high school with a man who pastors a church that holds this view. I was on their website recently, which is appalled by what I found there. All right. They rely very heavily upon a little book called The Trail of Blood. Anyone ever heard of The Trail of Blood? It's entirely fictitious. Every quotation in there is made up. I've looked them all up. And I'll not go into all that today as much as I would love to. 
Now, I'm not also going to take time to just sort of work through all this. Maybe at some point I need to do this. I'm just, I'm just putting that all out there so you know how people have approached Romans 11. But I do want to say one thing about the bride, and for no other reason to make you curious. All right? This is, this is going to get me in trouble. I know I'm, I'll do it anyways. All right? But I personally do not believe the bride refers exclusively to the New Testament church. I've never seen that in Scripture. Where does the New Testament ever identify the bride exclusively with the church? And if you're thinking Ephesians chapter 5, let me encourage you to read it again. Not now. You will not find the word bride anywhere in the passage. The dominant metaphor in Ephesians 5 is the head and the body. And certainly the passage tells of Jesus dying for the church and sanctifying and cleansing her to present her without spot or wrinkle or any blemish. And interpreters have read the spotless, wrinkle-free, unblemished white wedding dresses right into the passage. But friends, those white red wedding dresses are a modern custom. We have no evidence that women wore white, spotless wedding dresses in the first century. And the truth is that God sanctifies and purifies and washes the Jew just like he does the Gentile. And all that language that you find in Ephesians 5, believe it or not, including the wedding metaphor, is found also in the Old Testament. Besides, I will say this, the passage really does speak of the outcome of a marriage, not its commencement. So having said that, what is the bride? In my estimation, by the way, this is not unique to me either, by the way. I, I ran this past a theologian at Bob Jones Seminary many years ago. I said, I, I'm just, this is the, where I come out. Am I right about this? He says, exactly right about this. This is exactly what I've always seen. That was Gary Reimers, by the way. All right, so I feel in good company. The bride, according to Revelation 21 and verse 2, and 21 and verse 9, look it up, not now, is the new Jerusalem. That's the bride. That great future city consists both of Jews and Gentiles. Its foundations and gates are inscribed with the names of both ancient Jewish tribal patriarchs and the twelve apostles, which all happen to be Jews. That's the bride. Look it up. Revelation 21 and verse 2 and verse 9, the bride is the new Jerusalem. So, is the church part of the bride? Yes. Is the church exclusively the bride? I would say no. I would say the bride is all of God's people. So, all that to say, all right, you're still here. Thank you. All right. I saw one family leave, but they tell me they had to leave early anyway. All right, God has one plan of salvation. And God has one gospel, one Savior, one body, one people, one bride, one new Jerusalem, one olive tree, one new covenant that embraces Jews and Gentiles, and one great un uh, un un unveiling plan of redemption that God has pursued since the Edenic Rebellion. And God, friends, has one great future new creation. Even if there are phases of implementation, there is one gospel and one kingdom and one great resurrected king. But having said all that, I still have a bit of an issue with John Calvin and his interpretation of Romans 11 as being applied to the church. And again, here's what Calvin writes. And let's go back to Romans 11, by the way. I forgot where we are at this point. You're probably all over the place. All right? Here's what Calvin wrote. I extend the word Israel to include all the people of God. What is my issue? Well, true, there is such a thing as the Israel of God. I, that's not contested. Galatians 6 and verse 16. However, Paul cannot be referring to the Israel of God in Romans 11. In Romans 11, in my estimation, Paul is not speaking of the Israel of God. He is speaking of an Israel that is not of God. 
It's really that simple. He is speaking of an unbelieving Israel. There is nothing in the context of Romans 9 through 11 that suggests to me that Paul is speaking of the Israel of God. Everything there suggests to me, the entire context suggests to me that he is speaking of the Israel that is not of God. And to see this, let's actually go back to Romans 9. Let's just observe how Paul launched this whole discussion of Israel. It's where the whole thing started. Romans 9, verse 2, Paul says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Well, why, Paul? For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Who? My kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises, the whole Old Testament. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race. Think about that. The race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. I don't see how Paul can be referring to those words, in those words, to a redeemed Israel. Those don't refer to an Israel of God. Those refer to Paul's ethnic kinsmen, his kinsmen according to the flesh, who have not embraced the gospel. He is referring to Israelites who have received all those blessings in the Old Testament, but they have been cut off from Christ. And if you just read right back through chapters 9, 10, and 11, you will see that Paul is consistently speaking of unbelieving Jews. Paul says, for instance, in chapter 10 and verse 1, notice this, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, those Israelites, is that they may be saved. That's not the Israel of God. That's the Israel that's not of God. In chapter 11, Paul argued that even though a remnant believed, in verse 7 he says, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The remnant is indeed the Israel of God. But Israel as a whole is the Israel that's not of God. Or consider Paul's illustration of the olive tree. He speaks of natural branches being cast aside. And Gentile wild branches being grafted in. But he also tells those Gentiles, don't boast. God can indeed graft the natural branches back in. Those that are not grafted in at this point, they've been cast aside. That's not the Israel of God. These are rejected people. God can indeed graft those people back in. And now at long last, look again at Romans 11, verses 25 through 27. Romans 11, 25 through 27. And Paul writes, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. I find it impossible to read those lines without assuming that Paul refers to unbelieving Israelites. So again, there is such a thing as the Israel of God. The Holy Spirit inspired that term. And if you want to think of a church as the Israel of God, Jews and Gentiles in the church, totally fine with me. And I do indeed believe every line of Ephesians 2. I do indeed believe that God has broken down the wall of hostility that united and has united Jews and Gentiles in the one body, one church, one family, one temple. There is one bride and one future New Jerusalem. I don't have any problem with any of that. But I do not understand Paul to be speaking of any of that here in Romans chapter 11. He is speaking, in my estimation, of the Israel that's not of God. Paul's kinsmen in the flesh who have not embraced the gospel. And the question that Paul addresses in Romans 9 through 11 is essentially this. Will the Israel who is not of God 
ever become part of the Israel that is of God? Will that happen? And that was all option one. I told you that's the longest I'm going to spend with one option, okay? So here again is our question, who is Israel? And let's move quickly to option two. Option two is this. Israel, in Romans 11, refers to ethnic Jews. Israel, in Romans 9 through 11, refers to, all the way through, Paul's kinsmen in the flesh who have not accepted the gospel that he has been preaching all over the empire. When Paul says in 1126, all Israel will be saved, he is saying at long last, after the fullness of the Gentiles is grafted in, then Jeremiah 31 will come true. Those four provisions that Jeremiah outlined will indeed be applied to the natural branches at long last. God made a new covenant with Israel and with Judah, And yes, God is graciously grafting the Gentiles in, but God will come through on his promise. When God said in Jeremiah 31, I will change the hearts of Israel and Judah, and I will have a relationship with those people, and they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, and I will forgive their iniquity. God will come through on that at last for Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh. That, I believe, is the most natural reading of the whole passage. And that's why Paul quotes Jeremiah 31 directly in verse 27, and this will be my covenant that I will make with them to take away their sins. At long last, that is going to happen after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And that's why Gentiles should never boast. God, indeed, has the power to take all those dead branches and to graft them right back into life. And friends, wouldn't that be a great resurrection? Well, remember what Paul said back in verse 15. For if their rejection, that's the issue, is not of God, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? God resurrecting belief among those Jews. Now again, I believe that there is much to glean from option one. And I believe we'd be mistaken if we did not listen carefully to the emphasis of the New Testament on the unity of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. God has indeed broken down the wall of hostility. God has indeed gathered us into one body. We have one common Lord, one Savior. Abraham is the father of us all. But I actually believe that option, option one, stops short of understanding the full expansion of the gospel in the future, when Paul's kinsmen in the flesh embrace the new covenant. Don't limit it to just Jews and Gentiles, the fullness of the Gentiles plus Paul's kinsmen in the flesh finally embracing the new covenant. When the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, then God will indeed have his harvest of the Jews. And remember that great truth that we discovered way back in Romans chapter 4? God originally told Abraham that he would inherit the land. Remember all that? But suddenly that promise just stretched out to the ends of the earth. Paul said in Romans 4 that the promise to Abraham and his offspring was really that he would become heir of the world. The Old Testament said the land. All of a sudden it's the world. Abraham, you're getting the whole world. That's this enormous expansion And this is precisely what happens now in the mystery of the olive tree. All those Jews get grafted, I mean, all these Gentiles get grafted in, and that tree just grows enormously. It keeps spreading and growing into every tribe and tongue and nation. But don't forget about all those desiccated, discarded, dead Jewish branches. God has the power to take them and to graft them right back in and to resurrect them to life. I believe the passage is indeed saying that much. And in my estimation, that is the most natural reading of the whole passage from Romans 9 through chapter 11. Paul is referring to his kinsmen according to the flesh. He is referring to ethnic Jews. And isn't it really astonishing just to consider how God has preserved the Jews through the last 20 centuries? I really find it impossible to read the history of Jerusalem and the Jews without concluding that there is some sort of mysterious providence at work here. 
I mean, think of it. They have survived plague, famine, invasion, anti-Semitism, genocide, holocaust for centuries. All those ancient civilizations, the Moabites, Edomites, Ammonites, Girgashites, Babylonians, Assyrians, they're all gone. And yet there are Jews all over the world today. Why is that? Well, this is where I came out on Romans 11. Paul's kins in the flesh have some part to play yet in the gospel. Now, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I do believe that Paul is suggesting a future. And I'm looking at the time. I'm really going long, aren't I? Sorry. Okay, this is important stuff. I mean, the, the, the people write whole books on this sort of thing, right? And I'm trying to get into all one sermon, all right? I'll be really quick now. I got the third option. Here's the third option. All right, third option. All right, Israel refers to the nation of Israel, the geopolitical nation of Israel. When Paul says in verse 26, all Israel will be saved, he is actually referring to a geopolitical nation over there on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. Now this third view obviously necessitates Israel being reborn as a nation, which did indeed happen in 1948. And the, re, the, the rebirth of Israel actually gave major impetus to this view. According to this view, that geopolitical nation as a whole will suddenly turn and embrace their Messiah. And certainly you cannot see Jeremiah 31 as being fulfilled in Israel today. That, that nation is largely atheistic. So how should we think about that, this option, that, that nation, Israel's a nation? That's what Paul is referring to here in Romans 11. Well, in my estimation, this option is often fueled more by a whole system than by the text itself. Now, I'm not here to debate systems, all right? But the option is often fueled by commitment to a system. It was popular in classical dispensational circles to see a return of the Jews to Israel and a rebuilding of the temple as the key to launching the end times. And again, I'm not disputing that one way or the other. But that thinking went that during the tribulation, all of a sudden, that, oops, there goes my water. All right. All of a sudden, in the tribulation, that whole nation then converts and embraces the Messiah. Well, I simply mention that here because there is a kind of pressure that you can feel about a passage if you're driven to it by a system. And I'm really trying to avoid that. In my own view, I don't know that you can build much of a system out of Romans 11. In fact, I'm a little bit hesitant about building a system out of Romans 11 because it might actually diminish our efforts with the Jews. You might just say, well, you know, they're all going to be saved in the future in the tribulation. That's not for us to be concerned with now. All right? The second comment that I want to make on this option is that, again, in my estimation, I think it's probably too narrow, too narrow of you. Now, follow this very carefully. The first view limits the expansion, the expansion of the gospel among the Jews by including all the Gentiles in their numbers. The third view limits the expanse of the gospel among the Jews by focusing exclusively on the nation of Israel. But did you know the majority of Jews in the world today live outside of Israel? The United States, for instance, is home to 20% more Jews than Israel. And the situation is actually similar to Paul's day when he wrote Romans 11. They are scattered all through the Roman Empire. And it's also very similar to Jeremiah's day when they were scattered all over the, all through the nations. There's really nothing in Romans 9 through 11 that suggests to me that Paul is limiting his discussion to a future nation of Israel, a geopolitical nation. In fact, in Paul's day, Israel was merely an extension of the Roman Empire. And Paul's missionary heart told him, I need to evangelize Jews wherever I find them, all over the empire. So having said that, let me make one more comment, and that is this. Option two, ethnic Gentiles, would indeed logically include option three. If Jews all over the world embrace the Messiah, certainly that has to include millions of Jews living in Israel, would it not? Well, we shouldn't think, well, all the Jews outside of Israel are going to believe, but not the Jews in Israel. So all to say, option three, in my estimation, is really kind of a subset of option two. 
yeah, if the whole nation turns and embraces Christ, wonderful. But I think it's bigger than all of that. I think it's Jews all over the world that are finally going to be grafted back in. Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh. That, again, is the most natural way to read the whole passage. Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh, wherever they are, all throughout the world. Wouldn't that have to include, though, all the Jews living in Israel? So, again, I, I'm really forced, in my own thinking, to option number two. And I realize it's a whole lot to take in. All right, thank you for sitting there very patiently. And let me just conclude by saying a couple things uh, in the interest of integrity. I do want to conclude by just sharing with you my bias. I am biased toward option two because I think it best reflects the missionary heart of God. I just, I, my, my heart just always goes that way. The missionary heart of God. God is interested in redeeming the fullness of the Gentiles. And God is also interested in redeeming the Jew, not just as a subset of Israel, the Israel of God, and not merely the nation of Israel as a subset of all the Jews. God is interested in redeeming Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh. The missionary heart of God, driven by the relentless love of God for his fallen creation, is forever just pursuing those four great provisions of the new covenant, God will change the hearts of Israel and Judah. And God will have a relationship with those people. And they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, and God will forgive their iniquity. And guess what? We are all grafted into those promises. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for passages that are difficult passages that are perplexing, passages that force us to give attention, meditation to your word, Lord. And I pray, Lord, through our commitment to learning, to listening, that indeed, Lord, you would open our eyes to the truth. And Father, we do pray for Jews and Gentiles all over the world. We pray for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in, for the Israel of God to advance in all the world today. We pray, Lord, for Paul's kinsmen in the flesh, that they would indeed embrace the truth. And Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that city that has not known rest for centuries and millennia. And Lord, for the peace of Minneapolis and the peace of great cities all across this nation, where indeed, Lord, racial hostility is real. Where evil people, Lord, will foment rebellion and destruction and strife. And where, Lord, even those who have been commissioned to bring peace and protection, Lord, will act in ways that are unseemly and indecent and unjust. And Lord, we pray for police officers, Lord. We pray for wisdom on their part and knowing how to best respond to evil. Lord, we pray that they would not succumb to the evil that is in their own hearts. Lord, we're thankful for a nation of laws. We're thankful, Lord, for judges. We're thankful, Lord, that we don't live in a state of absolute anarchy. We see just a taste every now and then of what that could look like. And Lord, we are thankful for peace. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray most of all, Lord, for the peace of God to come and to rule and to reign in human hearts and the fullness of the Gentiles might extend into Minneapolis and to countries all, cities all over this country today that just need to know that Christ has reconciled us all together in one. We pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. All right, well, this will end our live stream.